7.52 p.m. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law uh, chapter 30A, chapter 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Grove South Bar Regional School Committee will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the gu general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the district website at the stated URL. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen or watch the meeting may do so in the following manner. NCAT Educational Channel, Verizon Channel 29, Charter Channel 194, or SAM Government Channel, Verizon Channel 37, Charter Channel 192. No in-person attendance or members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the district website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Before we begin the agenda, I'd just like to welcome the administrative staff that is in besides our superintendent, Greg Martineau. We have Stephanie Reinhorn, assistant superintendent. We have Rebecca uh, Becky Pellegrino, Heather Richards, Mary Ellen Duggan. We have uh, Keith Lavoy, and Marie Allen, and we have also tonight the athletic, uh, the principal of Algonquin Regional High School, Sean Bevan, and also the athletic director, Mike Marcerino. So welcome to all of those along with the school committee members that are in attendance tonight. The uh, first item that we have on our agenda uh, is to ratify the agreement between North Grove South Bar Regional School Committee and Algonquin Regional Teachers Association Unit C. I'd like to hand it over then now to Mr. Uh, Martino. So thank you, Joan. So we, uh, we entered into contract negotiations uh, this winter with uh, Unit A and Unit C. Um, we successfully came to a tentative agreement um, in March. Um, we used the interest-based bargaining as the process um, and we have a tentative agreement which has been ratified by the Unit C uh, membership. Um, and at this evening, it's really, we'll give a high level overview um, and then it will will the committee to ratify this contract. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Heather for a high level overview. Good evening. The, uh, the contract or the MOA is for a three year uh, contract adjustment and the wages uh, for the first year, the COLA increase would be a 1%. And the second year is an, a 1% and the third year would be a 2% increase. Um, also, there's some language changes to the reduction in force clause, just to add some clarity around um, the different categories that are within the reduction in force clause. Um, and then under time off, there are some changes um, with three bedside days um, being provided for not coming from the sick time. And then the sick bank, there is now um, some language around the sick bank. The sick bank. Um, and then one additional change for those individuals who work more than 187 days. So in addition to that, there are just some housekeeping language cleanup um, changes, and that's really just to ensure that there's uh, further clarity, but those are not material changes to the contract. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, anything, any other clarification, Greg? No, I think, um, thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was a, a succinct summary. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any questions from board members or comments? Okay. Seeing none, I would like to entertain a motion to accept and to ratify the agreement between North Bar South Bar Regional School Committee and Algonquin Regional Teachers Association Unit C. So moved. Moved by Paul Bucca. Second. Second, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Second by uh, 
Sean O'Shea. It's a roll call vote. Karen Ayers? Yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Chris Covino? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Kathy Highland? Yes. Kathy Key? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Sean O'Shea? Yes. Kathleen Pluchka? Yes. And Joan Frank, it passes unanimous. Thank you very much. And through the chair? Sure. I just want to um, also acknowledge our educational educational support specialists and administrative assistants and all the work they do in our buildings. Um, they do amazing work and really are a key part of the operations and working with students. So I just want to acknowledge their great work and, and the, the role that they play on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, ensuring that our buildings are safe, students have what they need, and operations are running smoothly. Yes, I'd also agree with that. And I think their qualities exceed even what would be in a job description. And I've always seen that um, anybody who is in our schools, but especially those that are in this uh, role in the unit C, they have the most flexibility and most willingness to move at a moment's notice to go help an educator or a student at any time. So I thank them for all their assistance. Okay, so the uh, next item we have is uh, ratifying the memorandum of agreement. Um, 2020 to 21 school year reopening between the Northwest South Regional School Committee and Algonquin Regional Teachers Associations Association. Any comment, Greg? So is the next, I just wanted to the chair, is the next item on the agenda athletics? I just wanted, I might be looking at the oh, wrong agenda. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's the most update one. That was one before. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, so let me go back. I make a correction onto that. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. The next item on our uh, is the athletics. I apologize. I wasn't sure if I had the wrong agenda. So thank you. I did. Um, so we, so welcome, Mike Masarino. So one of the uh, the unknowns around the, the pandemic is what's going to happen with reopening uh, this fall, uh, what that will look like. Um, also, a major part of that conversation is uh, athletics, um, you know, and extracurricular activities, you know, music, band, all those amazing things that happen Algonquin, at Algonquin. So we've received some more guidance and information around athletics from the MIA, and, and Mike is here to share um, some information uh, to have a dialogue and a discussion with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Barno. Um, can I share my screen? I have a brief presentation, yes. if you don't mind, a couple slides. Make you the, make you the co host. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Share. Okay. Can everybody see that? The slides, thank you very much. Well, first of all, good evening. Thank you all for having me. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to enjoy some sort of summer. Um, I know I've been busy for all, but um, I have a, a brief update on the athletic information that is known at this time. Um, more work needs to be done and protocols and guidelines need to be finalized, but I feel that the Midwatch League and the Central Massachusetts directors working with the MIA have formulated a proposal or roadmap, if you will, um, in conjunction with the approved MIA 2020 and 2021 athletic calendar. Um, just to begin, I'll provide you with a timeline of when COVID-19 pandemic affected athletics and where we sort of stand today. Um, as you can see on March 12th, athletics postponed, athletics was postponed due to COVID-19 and shortly thereafter, um, the spring season, and we saw what happened in the unfortunate and heartbreaking situation for all of our athletes when the spring season uh, came to an end um, on April 24th. After that, the MIA convenes with the COVID task force and considering the impact on focusing on fall sports. Um, just gonna minimize that. Shortly thereafter, the MIA aligns and start date with DESE and the school opening and has announced a new school date of September 16th. And then lastly, the MIA approves a modified four season schedule in all recommendations. The proposed changes through the MIA board of directors, they approved the modified four season schedule format. Um, 
On Friday, September 18th is the new start date for all fall practices. There will be no MIA fall tournament and athletes are eligible to play in all four seasons and we'll get into the seasons shortly. Um, I would like to add the disclaimer that as with all things in this pandemic environment, this process is subject to change based upon the future pandemic related information as it becomes available. Athletics will reassess the winter spring situation in the coming months. The Midwatch and Central Mass Athletic Directors took the approved MIAA four season format and applied it to the Midwatch and Central Mass schools. The following slides includes the Midwatch and Central Mass four season proposal, sports included, the start and end dates, and the geographical pods. With this, sport, with this first season as proposed changes for fall season one, you will see that season one sports consist of boys and girls soccer, field hockey, boys golf, and boys and girls cross country. All of these were labeled as moderate to low risk sports according to the EEA, MIA, and DESE guidelines. This season would begin on September 18th and end on November 20th. Tryouts and practice will begin on the 9th, 18th. Competitions will begin on 14 days after on and around October 5th, and the season would end around 11, November 20th. The other three seasons in the four season model, since we just reviewed the first season, season two, which would be winter. As you can see, we host all of our normal winter sports at this time. It will be starting on the normal Monday after Thanksgiving, which is November 30th. The only difference here is in season two that the winter will uh, be a relative a little bit shorter. Season three, which is fall phase two, is football, cheerleading, unified basketball, and girls volleyball. Football, cheerleading, unified basketball are all considered high risk sports by the EEA, MIA, TESI guidelines. Girls volleyball, although labeled a moderate risk sport, and due to the EEA indoor current guidelines, and many schools using indoor facilities and the indoor guidelines and schools use it for classrooms and lunches, we felt as a league to move the girls volleyball from fall season one to fall season two, um, and it is waiting approval from the Midwatch principals. Lastly, season four, which would be our spring and our consist of our normal spring sports. You'll see the difference there that it goes a little bit longer and starts a little bit later. It'll start on April 26th and they could run all the way up until July 3rd. These ending dates can be changed and adapted upon, amongst the league. The proposed Midwatch Central Mass Geographical Pod Model. The Midwatch and Central Mass League would divide schools into closely geographical pods. Through a modified geographical base competition structure, the league seek to creatively reimagine re what is possible within the constraints of the new health and safety protocols by limiting competition to geographic pods. The Midland, Wachusett, and Central Mass Leagues aim to create a feasible model for school-sponsored athletics throughout the duration of this pandemic. So an example of a geographical pod would be a pod one, when consists of Algonquin, Neshoba, St. John's, Shrewsbury, Wachusett, and Westboro, all relatively close. But we do have to do a disclaimer in regards to the geographical pods are subject to change, are not finalized, if schools decide to opt out of the season. So the pods may change and they have not been finalized. Uh, the pros and cons for the geographical pod that we came up as athletic directors, and I think some of these we've touched on, I touched on prior to this slide is that, but I'll, I'll, I'll go over, uh, engages student athletes in school and sports regardless of the academic model being used, in-person, hybrid, or remote. Allows for special transportation issues to be resolved with limited budget implications and limited buses needed. Allows for 12 game regular season and pod playoff all within itself. And you could play up to upwards of 15 games. If schools opt out, other schools within that pod can still have a schedule created. And each school of the four pods would only play certain schools in any given week. So if we are scheduled, just a quick example, if we are scheduled against Shrewsbury to play in boys and girls soccer, we will schedule to play them also in golf and cross country that week. And that would be to help with the contact tracing. There are cons. The cons are, that we came up with and, and, and discussed were the traditional rivalries may be on hold for a year. 
Schools could opt out of the season. No traditional league championships. No fall middle school sports. And no fall MIA postseason tournament. The ge geographical pod model principles that we've discussed and we agree on and support. We believe that this promotes social and emotional well-being of our student athletes. It controls social distancing, engages student athletes, and creates academic accountability, allows for students to still participate in all models, prevents students from seeking other less healthy extracurricular outlets, prevents losing student athletes to clubs or AAU sports that will still go on. Geographical pod model may be used in other seasons pending COVID restrictions and no overlapping seasons, and athletes do not have to pick what sport to play, thus stressing the importance of playing multiple sports. The, on 824, August 24th, which is just recently, uh, the Midwatch and Central Mass, uh, we created subcommittees to address the following topics of interest uh, with the goal to be universal and consistent for all schools. The following information is currently under con construction and protocols are due by each subcommittee next week. The items that will be discussed include the following, schedules, an example of no scrimmages versus other schools, staying with the traditional playing days, Mondays and Fridays for field hockey, Tuesdays and Thursdays for soccer, and proposed Wednesdays for cross country meet. This would help limit the number of games and people on campus. Athletic trainer protocols, General geographic pod rules and regulations still need to be completed. But something for an example would be no competing outside of our pod for contact tracing. Tryouts and practice procedures with the frequency, duration, locker room accessibility protocols will be. Game day protocols and transportation in conjunction with school protocols, which could impact travel rosters and or total number of rosters, including the sub varsity teams. Preseason coaches meetings, each sport, outlining each sport, identifying sports specific rules that will be approved on September 2nd by the MIA Sports Medicine Committee in conjunction with the EEA guidelines. And lastly, the fall two practice procedures is to be determined. Um, I'd like to close, if you don't mind, with a, just a quick athletic statement. Um, we realize that our school year this year is unprecedented, one of which we could never prepare for. The health and safety of our students are at the forefront of any decision we make. We believe the role of interscholastic athletics play in fostering deep and positive social and emotional health outcomes in our collective communities and cannot be emphasized enough. Athletics is a vital part of the student high school experience and we are prepared to offer program programming that is in line with the state and local rules and regulations. Student athletes are much safer and exposed to fewer people if they're in school sports versus club sports. Athletics and other school activities help the physical, social, and emotional well-being of our students, many of whom have felt isolated over the past six months. The more time we have with our students spent in organized activities, the less likely they are to do something with peers that is not safe, especially during after-school hours, which is when teens are most likely to engage in risky or questionable behavior. One topic discussed for the district as a whole is the idea of community commitment and stressing to all of the high school students that what they do outside of organized school activities will impact whether or not we can not only just have sports, but also in-person school. Reconnecting high school athletes with their coaches, whether that connection is virtual or in-person, is critical for so many students. In some situations, a coach may be the most significant mentor in a student athlete's life. So keeping that relationship intact is paramount. While we hope to be playing in some capacity, it's important for everyone to know that sports will not look the same that we are all used to for this foreseeable future. There are going to be many changes to our programs this year, and some sports will be playing in different seasons. And we all know that many details need to be sorted out, and sports-specific information and modifications still need to be worked out and approved, reviewed and approved. We are confident that we can provide a fulfilling, creative, and fun experience for our athletes. And we look for your support and approval transitioning into this academic and athletic school year. Thank you for that time for that statement. And just lastly, I would like to add that I did add the references to um, the EEA guidelines, the DESE MIA joint statement guidelines, and the MIA board of directors announcement that includes all of these announcements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marcerino, for this wonderful presentation. 
and all the time and effort that you've been putting in to make sure that our students um, are well represented in all these sports and also communicating it to the students and our parents. Uh, before I go to school committee members, I see we have a couple questions. Uh, Greg, any comments? I just want to um, speak that you know to the fact that we have been working very closely with uh, Mary Ellen Duggan and our district district physician, Dr. Medina, and reviewing um, you know the proposals and um, the merits of its safety. So um, that has been some work that Mike has been doing as, uh, uh, along with Sean. Um, in terms of really vetting the safety of, of the proposal. And Mary Ellen, I'm not sure if you want to uh, make any comments. I think, oh, sorry, I'll start my video. I think Mike has done a great job working with everybody and trying to get this off the ground and it's still a work in progress and we'll continue to put everybody's health and safety as a top priority. Okay. Um, and Mike, will you be willing to take questions from the board members? Yes. Yep. Okay. First I have is Paul Baca and then Kathy Key. Hey Mike, thanks for that presentation. Certainly athletics has been kind of a kind of an up in the air topic for us. I, I like the clarity. I had two or three questions if I could. Um, are, are there I mean I'm just curious about schools that have gone full remote as as a, a way to open their school year. Or, are there any schools in, in our upcoming athletic pod that you know of that uh, that are doing full remote and don't have the kids in school at all, but but somehow or other think it's okay to have athletics? Uh, this would be one question. The second would be, I hope you've been working with Becky a little bit if there's any foreseeable costs involved in, in any of these new activities, the new schedules we're doing. And, I mean, one that comes to mind pretty easily in, in my head is if, if, you, if you're starting football on February 22nd, you're going to be spending a lot of money plowing football fields, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see how you're going to get a, a clean surface to play on for a, several weeks, frankly. But, uh, I mean, are there, are there other costs as well? And, and, and if so, you know, what would they be? And, and you know, do you have any, any feel on how big they are? Because this virus is costing us a few bucks already. Well, Thanks again for your presentation. Oh, the day of for like an inch, and it's going to be perfect to play on. We're not going to have to worry about snow removal. See? <laughs> we'll lift the cloud the here, Keith. Well, <laughs> so just a, a couple comments. So as the pods stand currently, Wachusett it is in full remote, and um, their committee voted to participate in athletics. I believe it was uh, this past Monday. And secondly, part of our presentation this evening in the budget section is the impact of uh, athletics and moving forward with athletics. Obviously, gate receipts and, and um, fees are part of the operational and, and how we pay for um, athletics. So that will be a, a more formal presentation by Becky. But yes, Becky and Mike um, have been partnering on the, the financial implications of moving forward. Okay, um, Mike, would you like to answer some yeah, of the questions? Yeah, Mr. Bardo, I, I think answered the questions. Uh, but yes, in talking with the other schools and other athletic directors, I think we're all sort of starting on the same page, whether we're 100% remote for a certain time period and then getting into a hybrid schedule. But the feedback that I'm receiving uh, from the other schools and other athletic directors is that they're still going through the process also, but it seems to be gaining some support in regards to participating in athletics through this proposal, um, whether they are hybrid or remote mode. I don't have exactly the number, but within the mid-watch league, I would have to say it's it's not 100%, but it is, it's up there in regards to doing what we can do to participate. In regards to the financials, me and Becky have been talking about the financial implications of expenses and uh, revenues. And I will say that the football will be starting on fe uh, February 22nd, but it will be 14 days out before they can have their first competition. So that puts them right in line for when spring baseball is supposed to be on those fields that third Monday in March. So... <laughs> We have had been able to uh, work with those, with our facilities, our outdoor facilities in those early days, those end of winter before spring starts. And I think we have an opportunity where it wouldn't cost us additional expenses, but we have the opportunity with the facilities we have to get them out there playing. Perfect, thanks. Thank you both. Okay, Kathy Key. So my question was gonna 
be Paul Buck's question. Um, basically, how this, how you guys decide what sport we're playing in what season. Um, but I do have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that at least we're going to try it because I think that it's great to get our, our kids back in school, but sports is something that kids really look forward to after school, and it's their social activity, just like being part of a band or a play or something else. And I just, I think it's great to at least try and get them out there. Um, but yeah, the football question was mine. Okay, uh, Greg? Just want to um, share that I am in support of this plan as a superintendent, as long as we can do it safely. Um, and we, we're following all the protocols and the coaches are trained and students are trained and our medical expert team supports, um, you know, moving forward with what we know now with the understanding that this could completely change two weeks in a pandemic is like five years. So I just want to share that I am in support of the proposal. Um, and, you know, as long as it can be done safely. Okay, I have Sean. I will pipe in. I'm, yeah, I'm oh. sorry. Go ahead, Sean Bevan, Mr. Bevan. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Frank. I would uh, echo what uh, Mr. Martino said. I'm, I'm in support of this plan. I think it's thoughtfully developed, uh, and it has kids' safety um, first as the first priority. But it also, I think, delivers on as best we can. Uh, Okay. Oh. Um, is is that your concluding statement, Mr. Bevan? Came in and out. Okay. Uh, Sean Sorry, Ashe. yes, it is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sean O'Shea? Yeah, I just want to, um, I had a couple of questions and also just want to thank Mike for all the work he's done. And I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of collaborating with other ADs to put this whole thing together. And, you know, for you guys, to, to lose a whole season last year, everything you're passionate about is really hard. So, you know, I think it's good to give it a go and see where we are and reevaluate each season and through the season. A couple of questions, and, and it may not be worked out yet, so, um, and that's fine. I'm, I'm guessing um, busing, and you talked about costs later, but I'm guessing we're going to need more buses because you can only fit about 20 kids on a bus or something. For, so for like soccer and so on, you're going to need more buses. And the other health question related would be, um, like locker rooms, uh, is that just something you're still trying to figure out? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are going to, within the next week or so, there's going to be basically a handbook that's going to be provided from all the subcommittees information that will include uh, guidelines, suggested guidelines uh, from EEA, which has already started the adult and uh, youth and adult uh, guidelines uh, for us to follow for sports, amateur sports. Um, the one thing, the first thing about transportation is that I've talked to Mr. Lavoy about transportation just recently today, and um, we talked about the busing, the amount of bus, the size of bus that we can have. It will impact potentially the amount of kids that we can travel on. Uh, rosters will be determined or will be discussed as part of the subcommittee work. There could be a potential where they cap a roster, um, or there could be a travel squad roster where a certain amount of people go to an away games on a certain amount of days and everybody is able to play at home. Yeah. Um, and also, so we are taking that into consideration, but those guidelines will be provided within our mid-watch proposal. Understandable, yeah. And um, also, um, what about, what are we doing? I think this came up before. For kids who are on a hybrid off day, they're on a home day and they have a practice. Are we, are, is it up to them to get themselves to practice or, or how is that being approached? I would, I would put those, the those details are being yeah. worked out. Okay. We don't, we, okay. We've had some um, conversations. It's still a detail that we're discussing. And part of this is also making sure it's equitable that those who can participate can actually get to practice. Um, yep. so, we are looking at all those factors. We we in we have some ideas, um, but that will be a future conversations. Okay. Um, and lastly, um, it's a, so no tournaments. So is it just a season? The season's a season, or like going on record, or is there some other thought of being able to you know crown a champion or something? 
I think it's going to be a different so many ways. We had this conversation the other day with Principal Bevin is that um, the coach is going to have to understand there's going to be a lot of lenience that's going to have to go into our, our season schedule. The schedule is not going to look the same. We're not going to be able to have those 18 to 20 games, no MIA tournament at the end. What it's going to be is an opportunity for our kids to participate. Um, we're hoping that we do not have to shift in, well, you know, shift our, and, and unfortunately, uh, cancel the season. We're hoping that the data continues to trend positive and we are provided. But if we have a 100% season under this model, it would be about, it would be a modified 12 season game schedule versus your pod teams, play them twice, maybe three times. And at the end, there is a proposal to play within the mid watch to have a mid watch uh, type tournament yeah. if we're able to make it that far. But it will not be MIA related to MIA. Got it. Yep. No, I think that's good. Great. Thank you. Okay, Paul Desmond and then Kathleen Pluchka. I think Paul uh, Desmond's trying to call in. So, so no. Paul, try now on your phone. And I think you're on mute on your phone. You're on mute still. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, Paul. Uh, Kathleen Pletchko. He'll figure it out. He'll be back. Um, so, uh, so a couple of questions. I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's probably too soon to even remotely think about this, but I'd like to just throw it out there. And that is that when we start getting to the point where it, um, where we start having the high contact sports, um, I didn't really see anything about testing. And I'm perfectly comfortable, especially when we've got our pods, if, you know, like in these high contact sports where these kids are literally in each other's faces, uh, as long as they're tested and we know that it's, that it's not going to, become an issue and there's not going to be a spread. Um, so I guess my question is, is there, that's going to be the cost. Um, so is there money set aside or did you guys, did Mike, did you guys in all of your, you know, sort of coaching uh, discussions? Because it only works if everybody does it, right? If I do it, if Algonquin does it, but, but the other teams aren't doing it, then it doesn't really make any sense. So did, was there any kind of discussion about that, like where testing might come in and uh, if there was, and then did you talk to Greg about monies being set aside for it? In regards to the testing, the conversation has not been had in regards to the testing. I just, um, is it, are you discussing about the co high contact sport or high risk sport that were moved or the high contact sport? I just, for clarification, but there is no testing um, that has been discussed in regards to prior to an event that that takes place. Right, and so, and I and I asked yeah. of Mary Ellen yesterday, but um, hopefully by February there yes. will be a quick like spit in a cup or lick a stick or whatever something, and hopefully it'll be cheap. And hopefully, okay. So Greg, you're raising your hand. So yeah, so Kathleen, we've been talking about um, thinking about testing and working with our medical team, and and Mary Ellen has, um, you know, really helped pursue this. So we have people on it, and that is part of our. I think our back to school model and our back to athletics model that we're really advocating for. And that's some of the area where, where we'll need help from the school committee to advocate at the state level. Um, but also we have our medical experts are there, they are dogged on this and they are, they are turning over every stone and have some good leads. So I'm, I'm hopeful that by November, December, we'll have um, testing and some type of protocol to make that happen. And then obviously the financial impact, we are looking at, um, you know, what that would be to make sure that we can, we can do it in a, an affordable way. So all those conversations are happening behind, behind the scenes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then the uh, other question I had, and again, it's, it's not really a question. It's just sort of putting it out there, which is so many of us, you, the administration, you know, the, everybody has um, put so much work into determining if we should go remote or hybrid. And we've determined as a group to go hybrid. 
And one of the reasons I think is because we're all very cognizant that in Northboro and Southboro, the, um, the numbers are so low, they're practically nothing uh, in terms of COVID uh, positivity rates. So, uh, so I feel comfortable um, sending kids in and sending teachers in who are going to be exposed to those kids. So, um, so when you now have your athletic team or competition pods, I guess I'm just sort of looking for something that's a little bit more formal in terms of uh, when we are playing another team and they might be in a town where the positivity rate is just a little bit higher or maybe it's spiking. Uh, like I, I just, I would like to feel more comfortable, you know, for our teachers and our parents that there's going to be something more formal in place rather than just Mike's taking a look at it and, you know, and, and maybe Mary Ellen, but um, uh, so I don't know if that's specific numbers. I don't know if Desi kind of uh, has handled that. I don't know if MIA has handled that. But so I just throw that out because there's a, probably a lot of teachers and a lot of parents that are concerned. Mary Ellen, do you want to comment on that? Sure, I can comment on what we're doing. So, and I think that would impact how we proceed with other towns because we would expect that they would, if we're following a guideline, we're not gonna go to some other town that's looser in their guidelines is my thought. So um, what we will do if we move to a yellow or white or green, things stay the same. You know, we'd be in person, things, when we start to move to the yellow, our medical, our COVID response team, which includes all of our medical advisory board plus others in administration, would um, gather at, with the local boards of health and decide if it was in school transmission, what the transmission, where the transmission is really happening in the community. And th the same would go for red and then we'd make decisions on based on that information. So I would think that we would look at the towns that we're um, thinking of being in that little pod, that sports pod and apply the same things to them when we're deciding is it safe for our kids to go there or to compete against that town? Oh, okay, John, John, go ahead, because I was going to have a follow-up, but you'll probably answer it. Yeah, I think uh, the, the pod thinking delivers a lot of benefits for, um, for the geography and the transportation, but it, it also would de deliver benefits for if we can arrange with those limited number of schools for for, uh, for testing if that is a need. I think that allows us to do that at, perhaps, I don't know if it's feasible, but it certainly would be easier to do that with a limited number of schools than with the whole league. So I think that's that that certainly helps with that. That pod thinking allows us to, to reduce the variables for and the barriers for doing that, but I'd have to look into it. Hi, Greg. And then back to Kathleen. You're muted. To Kathleen's point, I think we we will sit down with our medical team and say what happens if a, a town is is in um, you know the yellow is outside of white or green, and it, it could be the will of the school committee to say or you know on, on advice of the medical team that if that is the case, we will not play um, that town. So we could be very specific around around that criteria as a community. Okay, and do we have? In this, in that situation, who makes the call? Like, is Mike the one who's charged with uh, keeping track of all the other towns and what their color code is, or is it Mary Ellen? Like, do we know? Have you decided? That would be Mary Ellen. Um, she does not know yet, um, but she's just learning this information now. It would be Sorry, Mary, Mary Ellen. Ellen. <laughs> These are um, Mary Ellen and her team. This is what they monitor daily. So it'd be a partnership with Mary Ellen and Mike and, and Sean around monitoring the data. Great, and I Mike, just want to make sure um, someone's in charge. I'm sorry, Kat. Um, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, we'd, we'd, be, be, we'd be playing the pods uh, a week at a time. So all of our teams would be playing a single town's other teams and not like mixed across um, week to week. So that if there was um, a high point in the COVID data from a neighboring town that we were playing, in two weeks, we would be able to, that would impact all the sports uniformly, but it would, uh, am I right about that, Mike? You're absolutely correct. I'm actually on the subcommittee that's going to be formulating the schedules, and that is our goal, to play the, the normal days that we have, but versus the school for that week, so we can follow, 
you know, who we're playing on a weekly basis, not only a day basis, but on a weekly basis. So we're not playing Shrewsbury on a Tuesday and watch choose it on a Thursday. We're playing Shrewsbury throughout the whole week. So we know if something pops up two weeks, like you said, as an example, we would know who we played that week and we would have to notify the school or vice versa. They would have to notify us and talk to our medical okay. professionals. Great. Thank you. Okay. Paul Desmond. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> awesome. Sorry about that earlier, but uh, the questions I had had been answered, but I just want to chime in and, and say um, I, I, too, support this plan, and kudos to you, Mike, and, and Sean Bevan, and whoever else was involved, because, I mean, I'm a big athletic supporter, and I, I do think it's a, it's a big part of the high school experience, and I was deathly afraid that the MIAA was just going to come out and say all sports are canceled for at least the fall and, and that would have been, you know, I think a mistake because obviously football is different from field hockey, is different from cross country and golf. So I just, I applaud this plan. I, I think, you know, obviously there are some kinks to be worked out and we're gonna have to keep an eye on things, but I just like this approach a lot. So thanks to everyone who helped make it happen. Thank you. Um, Greg? You're muted. <laughs> Can I make a recommendation around um, just moving a budget uh, agenda item up in the in the topic? Because I think having this conversation, it also needs to be the, the financial implication. So part of the budget conversation on the agenda uh, number four, item number four, is athletics. So I think it makes sense to have Becky present the athletic part of that section. So it's in the context of athletics and the bigger conversation. Okay, I just have one question, and just if we can just make sure, I, I think that's a great idea if it's a consensus of the committee. And is there any other questions here on athletics? I just have, I just have two. Um, just looking at season one, um, I am assuming that we're going to be like the major sport, league sports, where there will be no fan participation. Because I'm looking here at field hockey, girls soccer, if it's played on our field, I could see how some of the students may want to go to attend uh, and watch the game. What is your feelings on that? What, right now, there has not been any formal decision on uh, who is going to be able to attend. I know that us as a mid-watcher are working on with the guidelines from the state to, to finalize who and what the limit is in regards to uh, attendance. Um, there is, we do our, are working on a plan in place to track that. And I would have to uh, also include uh, more security details in regards to one way in, one way out, and understand who is going to be in. If we, in fact, we are allowed to have fans at the game, but that decision is yet to be determined. Okay. And my my last question was: You talked about a handbook, and yep. what is it? What is that handbook consisting of? Um, so next week, the individual sports committees uh, from the MIAA for field hockey, soccer, and all the fall sports committees are coming out with guidelines and protocols for them to follow. It's very similar to what uh, youth soccer came out with uh, in regards to when the EEA released their amateur and youth guidelines. All those guidelines will be presented to the leagues. Our subcommittee will come together and we will have all of this information in one spot for, for principals and superintendents to review. That will include all of the items that was discussed um, in the slide. And if I would refer back to just the slide for one second, um, all the information in this handbook or packet, guidelines, protocols, if you have it, will include the schedules, the protocols for trainers, game day protocols, which would include attendance, practice procedures, transportation, um, and preseason coaching information and including, although we have not addressed the winter, fall season two and spring yet, we're focusing more or less on season one in the fall, all this on a season to season basis, we will have all this in place as each season comes, uh, comes up. Okay, thank you. So, Mike, I'd like to thank you and Mr. Sean Bevan for your participation in these tonight. And I know usually we only hear from athletics maybe three times a year, four times, but uh, stay tuned because I think that if we get requests from the school community members that they like updates, um, I would make that, you know, make that request through the superintendent to see if you'd be able to attend another meeting. Uh, Greg? So Mike, pencil in your third Wednesday of every month. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> so I just want to, um, can I just make a general comment before we move to the budget 
is sure. to thank uh, Mike Massarino for his leadership. Um, this has taken a lot of thinking outside of the box and working with uh, surrounding area districts and really advocating for students. But I also think it's a, it's a larger uh, conversation around what makes a great high school. It's the, the fine and performing arts, extracurriculars, it's the activities which all connect students back to adults and mentors. So I think there's a, a bigger, broader theme here that I think that is important to keep in mind as we think about reopening and all those other experiences that happen outside of the traditional school day that really make the high school experience special for our students. Okay, now and Greg, one thing you talked about um, uh, that Wachusett um, took a vote to accept the proposal. Do we, as the regional committee, do we have to take a vote to accept this proposal before so we get is, into the budget? It is a local decision um, and it would be um, my recommendation to get a vote from the committee or, uh, whether or not it approves the plan um, and it just shows support. Okay, so um, if there is a motion from any committee member to that effect. Through the Greg? chair. Yes. Can I, can I just recommend that we review the financials before we vote, just because I think okay. that's an important piece of kind of the big picture. Okay, fine. So we're going to go to the financials, but because we're out of order on the agenda, can I just have a consensus thumbs up that everybody is in agreement to move that budget item up for athletics? Perfect. Okay. We've got a consensus. Okay, Greg, we're going on to uh, the budget with athletics. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca Pellegrino. Can I share my screen, Greg, please? Yes. Can everyone see um, the, my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. So so thank you. Um, as you all know, uh, the athletics um, program operates out of two budgets, actually. So they have their revolving account, um, which is driven by the revenues um, that are derived from our student athletic fees, and then also gate receipts. And then there are a few line items that also um, come out of the operational budget for the regional district. Um, for the revolving account, um, in FY21, the beginning balance was 79508 um, So we were uh, fortunate enough that as a result of this um, unexpected closure that we did have some cost savings and we were able to journal entry some expenses that had been previously allocated to the revolving account um, onto the FY20 operational budget. So it gave um, the athletics revolving account a little bit more room to breathe for FY21. Um, as you can see, I've outlined some of the fixed expenses that, that Mike has, as well as some of the variable expenses. And he and Suba Burns did a great job in terms of going through all of these line items and really trying to estimate where he may have some cost savings and then also some overages. Um, so we have some fixed expenses, which do include salaries. Um, there are two staff salaries included on that. Um, the fees that we pay for the impact testing, our fees to Maya scheduling, and our student insurance. And so those fixed expenses um, total $101,000. We also have variable expenses. And so this is where we really got, I think, into the meat of it and went through, like I said, each line item. And some of the areas where we thought we may see some cost savings um, were going to be in the entry fees. We know for a fact for the fall that we'll see some cost savings. We thought we might see some um, also with the officials since there will be fewer um, games that will be played over the course of the year because of the shortened seasons. Um, and so right now we are estimating that our revolving expenses um, would be about $224,832 um, between the fixed and the variable. Now, in terms of the operational budget, um, we do have a salary line item that is included on the operational budget. And then we also have our coaches' salaries that are included and the transportation. 
and this is the transportation um, that goes to the games. It is not for tournament play. Um, tournament play does come under the revolving, and that is another area where we would expect to see some cost savings since um, they are not going to be allowed to participate in tournaments at this time. So on the operational budget, we have um, about $533,000 uh, allocated for athletics. So Mike and I um, sat down and Sean, um, and we talked about the athletic fees. And so what we'd like to present to you actually are some different scenarios for the athletic fees based on the fact that we are going to have four seasons versus three. They're going to be abbreviated. Um, if a student is participating in all four, being um, cognizant of the financial impact on the family, um, so we've prepared three scenarios for you tonight um, for your discussion. Um, the first one is to maintain the $200 athletic fee um, as it stands. Um, last year, we had 1,354 athletes participate at all levels. That's from varsity down to JV2. Um, if we were to keep that same fee, the same number of athletes, then we would be anticipating $270,800. Um, right at this point in time, we are not um, projecting any gate fees. We don't know what the season is going to look like in terms of being able to have spectators. Um, and so we are not projecting any gate fees right now. Based on this scenario and all of those expenses that I had outlined previously, um, that would leave the athletic revolving account with a positive balance of $45,967. And this does not take into account the fact that athletics also started the fiscal year with a $79,000 budget, or rather um, balance. Scenario number two um, lowers the varsity and the JV1 athletic fee to 175, and then the JV2 athletic fee would be 125. Our thinking in this is that JV2 could possibly be the, the sports level that would be um, impacted the most. Um, and if we were not able to run a program for the JV2 um, teams, then we would be able to offer something alternative, like an intramural sport, um, strength and conditioning, and Mike, feel free to jump in if I'm butchering this. Um, <laughs> um, but just it would give athletes a different alternative. So it again, would keep them active and it would keep them involved. Can I just add back if you don't mind? I, the, the yeah. JV2. I think the, the the thinking of this is that the JV2 program right now it might be the most impacted when looking at this proposal program. So if for some reason we do not have uh, that, could be not having as many games as the varsity or JV1, where the varsity JV1 plays 12 games, they may only have to try to make it eight. It's looked at that way, or there may not be a JV2 program. With that being said, the out of season coaching rule um, can take an effect and our coaches can still work with our athletes and have more of an intramural program for them and still offer guidance for them for the fall season. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, our varsity and our JV1 athletes, last year again, we had 1,217, and then we had 137 JV2 athletes. So we would estimate the athletic fee under this scenario would bring in revenues of $226,675 with a difference of 1,842, again, not taking into consideration that starting balance for the revenue account. And then the last scenario is a flat across the board, $150 revenue fee. I'm sorry, um, athletic fee. Um, we had looked at the number of games that would be played um, this year as compared to other seasons or a normal season. Um, and it was, it's about two thirds um, of the games that would be played. That would bring us down to about $135 if we were to base it off of two thirds of the $200. Um, in looking at um, that number, you can see that there's already a negative if we do 150. 
Um, so we did bring that up based on the fact that we do have that beginning balance that we could fall back on to support this program. But again, it would give those athletes that wanted to participate in the four sports a little bit of relief. Um, we calculated that it would be the same if they were to participate in the four sports as it would have been if they were participating in three sports where they would be paying $600 in total. Um, we do have family caps, we have athletic caps, um, but we wanted to be mindful of the fact that there may be increased costs for families. Um, and so those are the three athletic fees that we had proposed for you tonight. And Mike, I don't know if you have anything else that you want to share or Sean. So the only thing I was going to add is with scenario three, and you just touched on it, is that when looking at now a new proposal of an athlete who could play four seasons, um, this would add up and equate to the amount that they would play in for three seasons. So I think that's that's one of the reasons why we looked at the 150. And knowing that we are not getting a full potential season, um, and the seasons are going to be limited for our athletes. Yeah, and uh, thank you for your preparation, uh, Becky and, and Mike. You both worked very hard to make sure we have a full picture of what the impacts of these decisions will be. I am eager to find something that makes sense and is, uh, is relatively cost neutral so that we get high value for our families and for our kids um, and that that doesn't cost a great deal to uh, our larger school community. Okay, I have questions from the committee. Kathleen Highland first. Or is your hand still up from last time? It was still up from last time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Paul Baca. So I'm just curious, Mike. I mean, I, I know it's I know it's early, but you know, with with such an abbreviated set of seasons, you know, to and Becky too, you know, to, to work the numbers, assuming the same level of participation this year as you had last year, with the concerns about the virus, with the concerns about, you know, money, with so many folks, you know, kind of struggling and, 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 and concerned about just, you know, pay, should I pay the money for such a shortened season? Is it, is it really worth it? Or should I, should I go elsewhere if I'm really, dedicated to playing my sport. I mean, if if there's fewer kids that show up, uh, you know, I don't I don't see that it's a dramatic drop in our cost, but I certainly see it as a as a fairly dramatic potential drop in our in our revenue to pay for everything. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have an opinion on that, Mike, at all? You, you think that you think you're going to get participation at, at last year's levels? So yeah, Paul, I think, I think, oh, go ahead. So, so Paul, just a comment. So in the initial assumptions that we had gate receipts, it was about $15,000 of gate receipts each season. So for that exact reason, Paul, we removed the gate receipts and put those at zero because, because we don't know what the participation rate would, would be. So that's, that is our safety valve in terms of, we, we do anticipate that most likely we'll have some gate receipts. Um, so you know, again, that's the safety valve that we're looking at in terms of, of lower enrollment for and participation. Just to piggyback off that, you know, my the gate receipts right now, obviously, we, we're not going to be able to collect gate receipts for boys and girls soccer that we normally do, but it's to be determined for our hockey and basketball programs and now our football programs that could be potentially moved to that 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 third season of the four. So um you know it's we don't have the rules on that yet so we can hope that we can potentially get but the realization is that we may not um i will say that the numbers that we went off of where the good thing is is that we have our sports in place and nothing has been canceled yet and i think when looking at the registration numbers now until we adjust it our registration numbers for trying out for all of our sports that are in place are relatively the same as where they were for last year so our numbers are still relatively high uh, for the sports that are going to be offered before we make that change, if we make that change. And I would also add, Paul, too, that that's one of the reasons why we um, purposely stayed away from really tapping into that beginning balance that we had on the revenue 
on the revolving account so that we would um, have a safety net there as well that we could um, lean to if we saw that our um, enrollments were declining. Okay, thanks. Uh, Karen? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that I, um, I appreciate the fact that you uh, were thoughtful to um, separate out the varsity and JV and JV2 because I do agree that they probably, you know, like you were speaking of having a travel team and a home play team. So that could definitely play into, you know, the fee. And so I, I just think that was really thoughtful. So I think that, that's great. And we'll obviously have to determine what happens down the road, but I think that's a good way to go. Okay, I don't see any other questions here from the board members. Um, Greg, did you want uh, a vote from us on the athletic fees for tonight, or can we wait until the next regional meeting? So my, um, it'd be the will of the committee. I mean, I think, I think, you know, it's, as I shared, it's very difficult to make a decision or, you know, take a vote without having a financial impact, uh, you know, so that gives you a picture, but you could, if it's the will of the committee, you could vote the proposal for moving forward with athletics and then come back to the fee, um, you know, at, at the next meeting. I just would caution you that as a, as a community member and as a, you know, as a parent um, preparing to pay the fee, it'd be nice to know what that fee was sooner than later. So what is the will of the committee? Paul Baca? So, you know, I, I guess I'm willing to postpone it a bit, but you know, it's, I think our next, our next meeting will be after athletics starts for the, for the first of those four seasons. Um, you know, I, I I, I guess we can wait. I mean, I, I, my initial thought on it was we're charging too much for, because I think it's, I think it's going to be not nearly as robust an experience as it typically would be. And yet, you know, I mean, we're still, you know, we're still talking about some fairly hefty fees for, for kids to pay. Um, you know, I know that we're trying to break even on the, on the program and, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but it, it you know, th this might be one of those loss leaders that we need to, we need to kind of shoulder some costs on and not, not dump it all on the student athletes to pay. I'm not sure what other folks think about it, but um, it, it does not look to me like the same kind of experience that they've had in seasons past. And, and yet the, the fees could be similar. Okay, I have, Paul, are you, are you done, Paul? Yes, I am, yeah, I was just saying, just kind of one man's opinion. Okay, and it counts. Uh, so next I have is Paul Desmond and then Sean O'Shea. Yeah, I agree with Paul. I, I think of the three proposals, I like the third one the best um, for some of the same reasons he cited. I mean, if it's a shortened season, it should be less money. And, um, and the, the fee that you're proposing is even a little bit higher than, as you said, it ought to be if you go by the number of games. So, but, you know, I think it's fair and I like that a family won't have to pay more than they would have in a three season scenario. You know, so I, I just think it's well thought out and with the money we have left over from last year, you know, we're not losing anything. So I, I'd be prepared to make a motion to uh, approve that third proposal. Okay, can I get back to you after we hear from Sean O'Shea? Sure. Okay, Sean. Um, yeah, I agree with Paul and Paul. I just think when we're starting to talk about athletic fees, I, I think um, at some point we ought to talk about other fees also. Um, isn't there a student a, a student a student activity fee and and, and and things like that? If other if other activities are going to be shortened or shortchanged or we're you know I, I think. Um, we should look at the whole student body and not just athletics. Um, and just for clarification, when we get down to the FY2021 budget, uh, those two are going to be also looked at, Sean, parking okay. and the student activity fee. So. Okay. 
be prepared. The good point. Thank you. Uh, Chris Covino. Hi. Uh, thank you, Joan. Um, I actually just want to echo what Sean said. I think um, I certainly would be in favor of um, scenario three in terms of uh, reduction in the length of the athletic season. But I definitely think we need to consider uh, when that comes up for discussion, um, the impact of um, those other fees uh, and the amount of participation that students are going to have with those fees. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we uh, definitely address that. Um, so I agree with Sean. And I, you know, I, I also want to say, and please correct me if I'm wrong when I say this, that we are shouldering we are shouldering a pretty significant expense for the athletic program out of our regular budget as well. Um, but I, I also agree that um, given the fact that we do have that, I guess you call it a surplus from the spring, um, that I think it would, it would make sense to, uh, to adopt scenario three. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go back to Paul Desmond. Well, I don't know if that, I mean, that's a good point about um, thinking of this in the context of the other fees. So I don't know if we want to table this for a little later and um, in the meeting and take them up collectively or. Uh, Greg. Now that you've seen the, the context of the athletic fees, you could go back to the athletic agenda topic and vote that. And then we could go through the fees and then talk about fees and then vote the fee. Cause I think they're two separate, uh, although they're connected, they're two separate um, votes potentially. Okay, thank you for all the good comments, everybody and the administrators, really appreciate it. So um, keep that to the side now that we've had a good highlight of the athletic fees. Let's go back to the athletics and the proposal that was given to us about the um, makeup of the leagues. And I guess, Greg, you'd like to have a vote um, on that, correct? A vote to vote that plan for our, for our schools, for our Algonquin Region High School. Okay. So Is moved. there a uh, motion by? Dan. Dan Kalenda. Okay. Thank second. You. Second, Paul Desmond. And Paul Desmond, okay. Any discussion on the motion on the table? Does anyone need to have it clarified any further or you have it in your mind? Paul Bucca? Well, yeah, just, I mean, it's certainly a very tentative plan. Um, you know, I, I think we'd want to make sure that, you know, part of our motion included a requirement that you know, Mike either come back to us with great regularity to provide more clarification than we've got right now, or that Mike provide that clarification through Greg. But, you know, in, in some case, you know, I, I mean, there was, there was a lot of still to be decided sort of uh, uh, issues in, in, in Mike's presentation. Not to, not to say they haven't done a lot of work, but there's still a lot of work left. And, and I, I don't know that we'd want to just okay it without, without that qualification. Uh, Dan? So, so Paul, I mean, my, my thought is that was clearly part of his presentation. Got it. Okay. All this is, is subject to change at any time. I mean, it could be, could be next week, it could be next month. So, I mean, my motion is for to accept it as proposed. Clearly, I, I, I you know, and I hope nothing has to be changed except for the, for the better. Um, but I clearly understand that something could happen and that he would come back to us in the subsequent meeting and we'd have a different vote if need be. But I, I, I'm not looking to change my motion. Oh, I don't want to change either. I just said in stone. I think you're exactly this. right. We have that understanding that it could change any time. Yeah. Uh, Greg? So I think that the details around the safety protocols, the handbooks, all those pieces are, are, will be vetted through Mary Ellen and our medical team. So that's a part of the partnership that exists. So those are some of the details I'm going to be looking for as a superintendent to make sure that it's well thought out, kids are safe, because that's our number one priority. And I think from the presentation and from the uh, discussions that uh, you've heard from the different School, various school committee members, I think um, Mr. Marcerino and Mr. Bevan understand that we may be asking for more frequency 
on athletics and feel free that you can you know come into the agenda you know within the a lot of time so we can get you on the agenda and let us know any updates that happen okay and we'll probably see you a lot of you so we have a motion on any other discussion from uh, board members before we take our vote okay so we have the motion on the table by Dan Clendon seconded by Paul Desmond this is a again a roll call vote Karen Ayers yeah. Paul Bucca yes Chris Covino yes Paul Desmond? Yes. Kathleen Holland? Yes. Kathy Key? Yep. Dan Kalinda? Yes. Sean O'Shea? Yes. Kathleen Palachko? Yes. And myself is yes, so it passes unanimous. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, athletics are going to come back up. Just stay tuned, okay? Thank you. All right. Okay, so next on the agenda is the FY 2021 budget. The first bullet under it was COVID-19 impacts. So just to provide some, some context, I'm stating the obvious. One of the areas that we're monitoring very closely is um, the operational budget and the impact COVID-19 is having on our FY21 budgets. Uh, we, Becky and I and, and her team uh, speak frequently, not daily, about the budget implications. And um, she's done a great job kind of monitoring and projecting out. And this evening, she'll present um, our forecast of, of budget impacts, as well as a conversation around fees and whether there needs to be a reduction of fees due to um, the COVID-19 situation. So I'll turn it over to Becky. Thank you, Becky. Do okay. you still have? Okay. Yeah, I'm still. Thank you. So um, what I have um, put together tonight is a variation of the um, spreadsheet that I had provided last month, or I guess it was just a couple of weeks ago, um, that showed some of the areas that we're closely monitoring as it relates to COVID-19. Um, we had out, or I, rather I had outlined some of the receipts um, that we anticipated that were specific for COVID-19 and then also some of our projected expenses. Um, since I last presented, um, we were recipients of a remote learning technology grant. Um, we had received word of that. Um, and while small, it's going to be helpful. It was 2,357,000. Oh, I wish it was 2,357,000. It was $2,357. Um, and in working with Julie, we are planning to um, purchase hotspots with that, as well as um, offset some of the expenses for Chromebooks since there is a match in this grant. Um, and so we were delighted to receive that positive news um, and to add that to our receipts column. Um, so this spreadsheet is going to track and what I will do is it will be a fluid document and each month um, at our school committee meetings, I will present to you any differences in these particular categories. And then if any other um, categories that um, we had not foreseen um, appear, we will add that to the spreadsheet as well so that we have a running document of um, where we're experiencing some, um, some challenges due to the, um, the pandemic. Um, so you can see that we have already year to date incurred some costs um, in our contracted personnel. Um, we do have some temporary help um, in the central office helping out um, human resources as they navigate through all of the staff leaves that are happening um, and all of the changing landscape in the human resource world. Um, we also have been purchasing PPE, um, placed another order for masks last night um, and so I have actually adjusted the PPE um, so it is different from what it ha you had seen a couple of weeks ago and so now I'm projecting an annual um, cost of about $20,000 in PPE um, and then finally the, the big one is our facility and our cleaning supplies. I also adjusted um, the annual projection for that line item um, to be $81,161 from year to date, we've spent $33,506. Some of these are fixed expenses. 
Um, so they may be the, the backpacks, they could be um, some air purifiers, um, things that we will only need to purchase one time. However, we do anticipate seeing um, an increase in our cleaning supplies in terms of just like um, paper towels, um, solution, um, and obviously the solution for um, the backpack sprayers that we have. Um, so I would expect probably over the next um, month or so that we'll see some of those other um, columns fill in some expenses as well. Um, and just another um, point of reference for that um, remote learning technology grant, this is another grant that does have to be spent by the end of this calendar year. So that and the um, school reopening grants both need to be spent by December 30th. Um, so we've already talked about the athletic fees, um, but I did want to um, cover some of the other uh, fees that are um, that we have at the high school. And again, I've been working closely with um, Sean and his team um, to to really look at um, the numbers um, and come up with a proposal for these for the different fees. Student parking. Um, so what I've laid out for you here is um, what the past two school years um, experience has been. So if I'm sure many of you know, because you've had to write that check, um, that the permit fee is $100 per semester. So we collect it once in the fall and then once in January for the spring. Um, last year, I'm sorry, two years ago, we had 804 permits that were sold, and then last year, 747. So we did see a decrease um, in those permits um, from one year to the next. I've also put together four years worth of expenses for you. Um, and last year in FY20, our expenses were higher because we also had the paving project where Mike Gorman had um, a portion of the parking lot paved. Um, and so that is really an outlier um, for those four years. However, in doing the um, average, I did want to include that in there in case we had one of those um, really bad winters where our, pay, our plowing costs may be higher um, than we've seen over the past two years. So with the paving project in there, our four-year average of expenses has been $68,978. And without the paving project, it has been $56,087. So in looking at what the semester is going to look like, the fact that students are not going to be coming into the building five days a week, that the school year is not really, that students won't be on the campus until October 6th, we are proposing a $35 per semester parking Again, we used last year's numbers just as a reference point um, to come up with what the estimated revenues would be, and we are looking at a $26,000 um, revenue source from the parking fees. This, um, this revolving account, we were also able to use some of the uh, additional funds we had left at the end of FY20 to journal entry some of the expenses that were paid in FY20 onto the operational budget. So we have a beginning balance of 74,000 in the revolving account. Um, that coupled with our estimated um, permit revenues would give us about $100,000 for the year and you can see that even with both of those scenarios, there would be an ending balance. So that would offset the fact that if we have fewer permits that are being sold, fewer students coming on campus, um, so that would offset that potential lower amount of permits being uh, sold over the course of this school year. The next fee that I wanted to present to you is the student activity fee. And I would ask Sean if you, um, you know, have anything that you wish to, to share during this as well, feel free to, to pipe in. Um, but we are proposing that the student activity fee remain at $50. Um, the reason being is that we do plan to operate the same activities. They may be modified in some way. Um, however, we do plan on holding those throughout the school year. The activity fees are 
also the same as if you were to pay class dues at another school system. Um, and so it's one way that we are able to really fund the stipended positions that help support these positions. Um, the beginning balance for the activity fee was very low. It was $4,645. Um, we would estimate the revenue for the fees to be about 69,000. Of course, this is if every single student were to pay that $50 um, revenue fee, and we know that that does not happen every year. Um, and so that would give us a fund balance of $73,695. Um, our estimated stipends are in the $61,000 range, um, which would leave an ending balance of about $12,000. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to present the Tiny Tomahawks. Um, Tiny Tomahawks is a small preschool program that is run out of the high school. Um, it's a part of a curriculum and the students um, are actually in the classroom with the Tiny Tomahawks um, students. Normally our annual tuition for this program is $400. We are um, actually proposing that we not charge an annual tuition for this program since it is only going to be offered remotely to the Tiny Tomahawk students. We are instead proposing that a $50 fee be charged to offset the cost of any printing, copying, and mailing of materials to those students. Um, this uh, is a very small revolving account. Um, the only major expense that is um, paid out of this is a $10,000 portion of one of the teachers that covers the program. Um, and so we did have a healthier balance at the beginning of the year of 16,000. And so by charging the 1,000, it's really going to be kind of cost neutral to us where we would still be ending the year with $7,556 um, after taking out the teacher salary line item. Um, and so those are, those are our proposals for the fees and I welcome any questions that you might have um, about them. Um, let's see, I have um, Paul Baca. Yeah, so I always got something. Uh, uh, Becky, have, have, has there been any conversation with, with maybe um, the facilities folks about about in the winter shutting down one section of the parking lot to reduce the plowing costs and it seems to me you're going to have 350 or 400 less cars per day than you have uh, otherwise if you know if we stick with a hybrid solution you now i wonder if there's a way we can we can you know save a few dollars there i i very much applaud the the very dramatic reduction in the in the parking fee i think that That'll be well received by people, but you know maybe we can maybe we can do some things to keep our our expenses for that parking lot down a little bit once winter comes as well. That's something Keith and I can yeah, um, certainly yeah. look into um, and probably work with the town on as well. Okay. Yeah, it's a good idea, Paul. We'll we'll start to explore that. Yeah, my my only concern would be that you know the egress and the safety yeah. of not having plowed parking lots for you know, we'll, we'll work with the police chief and fire chief. Yeah, that was going to be the other thing I was going to say. I'm sure they would weigh in on that as well. Okay, let me see. Um, I don't see any other questions from board members at the present time. Sean O'Shea. Um, so the tiny Tomahawks, that's just 20, 20 students? About that. About it's that. a very I, I it's mean, a very small program. Yeah, a remote, and they're what three three and four year olds. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think fifty dollars is trivial. I can't see charging families to get things mailed home to them to part to participate in that. I just and we'll still have an ending positive balance. I'm I'm just not sure. Of, do we do we really need to charge that fifty dollars, or if there's another reason to to hold that 
So Sean and I had conversations about this um, and the thought was the $50 um, also holds their spot for them, you know, because it would be a free program. The fear would be that we would have students that would sign up and then would not participate in the program and then okay. the Algonquin students lose out on that opportunity. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen uh, Duggan. Sure. Did, have we determined if any students will actually sign up for Tiny Tomahawks with it being totally remote? Um, we already have families that had signed up um, last year. Yeah, and the teacher, Susan uh, Muse, is confident that we'd, we'd get uh, a number of students to participate in it. Okay. Um, Sean, did you have a further question, Sean and Shay? Okay, thank you. All right, seeing that, um, Greg, do you have anything to add before we go into a vote for these fees? No, just uh, thank Becky and the finance team for the great work and analysis, you know, that's happening. So we're trying to be mind as mindful and proactive as possible looking about at the, you know, the impacts the pandemic is having on our budget. So I just want to thank Becky for her hard work and, and her team. Yes, thank you very much because, I mean, we're still in the time we're taking um, aware of the financial impact that it's going to be on the parents, but yet we still want to offer the services that we had normally, uh, you know, the activity fee, the tiny tomahawks, the athletics, and also the parking. So I'd like to thank you for the great analysis and it was nice to see that we did have a um, balance in the positive and we were able to use it to some of these, uh, one of these four um, uh, fees coming up. And we're still, you know, being mindful that we're, we know that these are important things for our students and even the tiny, ta tiny tomahawks for those students that will be Algonquin students in future years to come. So I would like to take these in four different votes rather than bundling them all together. Is that okay, Greg? Yes. Okay. So um, how about if we do the athletics first? If I can have a motion on the table. I know there was some consensus before about the scenario that we wanted to do. Does anybody need a recap? Paul? Yeah, I, I, I'd like a recap just to see the, the, the three different proposals and, and you know, how much money they, they, they bring in versus what we anticipate spending again. Just I didn't write it down when, when Mike was presenting it and, and I wouldn't mind seeing it. Would it be how, uh, uh, is, if Mike is still there, can he uh, put those slides back up? So Becky, Becky has those slides for us. Oh, she does. Okay. So I don't see anything here. I hear, see costs. I don't see anything about the three different prices. The next slide, Becky. Okay. All right, there we go. Thank you. So this first scenario is the $200 scenario. Um, again, assuming the same number of students from last year, um, not taking in, uh, not using any of the beginning balance of the revolving account and ending um, with a positive balance of $45,967 in addition to the 79 that we started the year with. Scenario two is the, um, the hybrid, I guess, of the, the two different fees with the 175 for the varsity JV1 and 125 for JV2, um, breaking out those athletes athletes, you would have revenues of $226,675. You would not have to utilize any of the beginning balance and you would have an approximate ending balance. It would basically be a break even on this one with $1,800. And then scenario three is the $150 um, athletic fee uh, and that would mean that we would utilize $21,000 732 of that beginning balance for the revolving account. 
And Becky, if you could just keep that screen up, and then if somebody makes a motion uh, for the different scenarios, would you put that one up as soon as somebody makes a motion? Okay. Yes. All right. So at this time, is there a motion on uh, accepting one of the three scenarios for the uh, athletic fees? Joan? No. Yes? It's Dan. I, I, I can't find my little... Uh, way to raise my hand anymore on the screen so oh just you can yell out i know who i All i'll right. get you that way so, so dan so, uh thank you joe so while while i i i uh, look forward to the day when these fees are uh dramatically reduced or eliminated um i move that we adopt scenario three so the motion is made by dan calenda to accept um the athletic fees scenario three which would be 150 dollars um, for the fee. Is there a second? Second. Second by Karen. This will be a roll call vote and to change things up as the evening goes on, I'm going to start from the end of the alphabet. Can we, can we discuss a little first? Yeah, sure. maybe discussion. Sure. Go so, ahead, Paul. Yeah, so, so Becky, just again, to, so this scenario three costs us 21700 but we've got a balance going into the year, right? This, this does not eat up the entire balance. Exactly. The so starting it, balance is 79000 Okay, so that's a lot of money. So if, if we, I mean, 150 versus 200 still strikes me as a, a decent amount of money for a dramatically reduced, and maybe, maybe I'm over, I'm, I'm exaggerating this, but it seems to me like it's a much less of an experience than it usually is. I mean, if we brought this down 25 more dollars, it would cost us, what, another, I'm not sure what the math is, um, 30, 35 grand or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, about 33,000. And we'd still have some of our starting balance left over. Is that correct? Yeah, because we, right, I mean. Yes. We'd still have about twenty-five grand left in the bank when all was said and done. It, yeah, it that, very, that, I, I get it that these are pretty round numbers. But. I, I think the the thing with that um, balance, though, with the twenty-five thousand, is if we do have increased um, transportation costs. Um, but sorry, Greg, I jumped the gun. No, it's okay. I just want to add. Um, also, talk about the the potential testing. You know, the COVID testing. If there are tests. There is, a, there is the um, potential for additional expenses in, in that area as well. So those are some of the conversations we, be, we had behind the scenes around, you know, what are those areas, transportation, potential COVID testing that we'd want to have some flexibility around having the funding for. So, you, so what you're saying is you think you need to sit on a, a cushion of more than $50,000 for that? Uh, yeah, I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Paul Desmond. Yeah, Paul, I, I appreciate your your point of view here. Uh, uh, let me give you mine from a parent of two student athletes who was pretty willing to pay two hundred dollars each for fall season to be told that I'm paying one hundred fifty. I'm happy. So. Thanks, Paul. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will now take this as a roll call vote, starting at the end of the alphabet. Kathleen Palachko? Yes. Shauna Shea? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Kathy Key? Yes. Kathy, Kathleen Holland? <laughs> yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Uh, Chris Covino? Yes. Paul Butka? Sure, yeah, yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Karen Ayers? Yes. And the chair votes yes, and it passes unanimous that the athletic uh, fees uh, will be a scenario number three of $150. Okay. The next fee will go in the order in which um, it was uh, on the agenda, parking. So, is there a uh, slide 
Becky, that you can put up for parking? Um, I put, I did put it up. Oh, was it up there? Okay. Can people see it? No, no, I don't think you're sharing anymore, Becky. Oh, I didn't know I had taken it down. I can see it on mine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so the proposed parking fee structure is for $35 per semester for the 2020-2021 school year. So moved. So moved by Sean. Sean O'Shea. Yep. And second. I'll second that. That is Paul Bucca. Paul Bucca. And uh, let me put my screen so I can see part if anybody has their hand raised. Paul Desmond, do you have your hand raised? And Paul Bucca, or is that from last time? Well, that was to make the motion. I'm oh, I'm that. sorry. No, it's I'm all right. Sorry. Down now. Okay. Any discussion from any board members or comments? Okay, seeing that there are none, this will be a roll call vote, and that's for student parking fees of $35 per semester. Kathleen Palachko? Yes. Shauna Shea? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Kathy Key? Yes. Uh, Kathleen Howland? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Chris Covino? Yes. Paul Butka? Yes. Karen Ayers? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative, so it is a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. The next one is the student activity fee. And the student activity fee would stay at $50 for the school year, correct? Or is it per semester? For the school year. For the school year. Are, is there any board member that would like to make a motion to accept? I would move that we accept the $50 activity fee as we have charged in past years. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Yeah, yeah I'll second. I'll second. Okay, Kathy Key, second. Is there any further discussion or comments? Uh, Paul Bucca? So, I mean, just, you know, so this covers the stipends of all of the educators who work with our kids in all the various after school programs that we have. And we have strong confidence, some confidence that a lot of those programs will somehow or other continue this year and thus we need the we need the money to cover those stipends. That that correct? That's what we're hearing from the administration? Sean, I'm not sure if we want to Sure. Yes, Paul. Uh, that's that's the plan. I think this year, more than ever, even uh, it's going to be important to reconnect kids to school. And uh, for many kids, that happens through clubs and activities. And for the advisors, they're going to work to provide, uh, when needed, hybrid versions of that. So you might be running a club where half the kids are there because it's their in-person instruction day. Um, and then you are finding a way to engage the other students remotely. So. I actually think the task of the club or activity advisor might be a little bit more complicated this year than other years, but I think for a lot of kids, they find these affinity groups and clubs and activities to explore interests that uh, are, are really exciting for them. And I think this year it will be um, as, as important as ever to support those uh, endeavors. Yeah, maybe more important. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I have Chris Covino and then Kathy Key. Chris? Uh, thank you. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Sean. Actually, I just want to... Um, kind of echo what Dan Kalenda said earlier about the athletic fee. You know, I look forward to a time where um, this particular fee, this $50 fee uh, per student uh, is absorbed into our regular budget uh, because um, I think that these programs are important. They're an important part of, um, of activities for students that don't necessarily participate in athletics. And um, I think that it's important that the community um, 
uh, support students that are not necessarily into athletics, and this is the outlet that those students would use. So I, uh, like Dan, look forward to the day where this is uh, just part of our regular budget and we're not charging anything at all for these uh, activities. Thank you. Kathy Key? Um, yeah, so I was just going to say that um, as far as uh, like clubs go, I know that Best Buddies ran all summer. So Ella's still part of Best Buddies and she's still best together with hers even though she's going off to college. So I think that, you know, the advisors still are working with the students to put the activities together. So getting paid for this stipend, I don't think is, I think it's fair because a lot of them are still going on. Thank you, Kathy. Are there any other comments from board Joan, members? Joan, yes. Yes, Dan. So um, would these clubs not happen if the stipend, if this, excuse me, if this fee was, were not assessed, would these clubs still happen or would they be not offered at Algonquin anymore? So there it's based on the student activity um, and some money on the operational, which is a minimal amount. So it's the combination of those, those two. So there, are a lot, there would be a lot of experiences students would not be offered as a result of not having this funding mechanism. So, because I'm prepared to vote no for this, I mean, I, but I'd like to hear just a little bit more on that, Greg, if I may. So, um, the, you know, I, again, I, I look forward to that day, like Chris just said, where these fees are part of what students pay, it's part of what parents pay, it's, it's in the taxes, it's, you know, it, it, we, we nickel and dime, and now in the hundreds of dollars, um, parents, when, it, you know, Yes, there are budget issues with the school right now and, and our, our communities, but there are clearly issues with our parents too, many of whom may be you know, struggling financially during this time. And, to, and to, again, we, the, these fees just keep coming every single time. I, all right, so we can make an argument for if you're going to park your car there, again, I don't like it, 35 bucks. If you're going to play a sport, Okay, there's some costs associated with that that we're we're calling a fee now. Here's that. This student activity fee is charged to every student in the school, regardless uh, of whether or not they are participating. Is that correct? That is accurate. So why why is that as opposed to how it's being done for the other fees? So I think that and we have enrollment numbers and I don't have them off the top of my head right now in terms of participation and extracurricular experiences. Um, I would, you know, and, and we can get that data for you, Dan, um, but it's significant. The number of students who participate in some type of club or after school activity or experience is, um, is in the 90% or greater. So, um, and the other piece is, if, I don't know if Becky, if you wanna talk about what is currently on our operational budget in terms of um, activity fees and so forth for funding that these types of experiences. And lastly, I just think, I think I, I too think it's a very important conversation for the committee to have around fees and the role fees play or don't play in an operational budget. And, and would hope that we could do, we could have those conversations as we're building budgets so that we don't lose opportunities for students because um, we've lost the mechanism that we predicated experiences on. Um, so I'm in support of having those conversations in the FY22 budget and think we need to have a, a you know, serious conversation and we wouldn't want to lose any opportunities for kids this year. All right. So I, I appreciate that, Greg. And I, again, I, as you know, I often, if not always, will follow your learned advice. So um, with that commitment that we will have this discussion on fees, in particular, this, this student activity fee, that if that can be rolled in, if, if 90 plus percent of our students are participating in some sort of activity like this that warrants the fee, then why isn't it part of our budget? Why do we have to have a discussion every year about another $50 that we got to send reminders out to parents on email, hey, you didn't pay your $50 fee? Uh, and parents questioning, well, what's that? I mean, let's stop that level of madness and, and put it into the budget if everyone virtually is, is using it. I'll stop there and be prepared to vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Greg. 
Any other comments from board members? Okay, seeing none at this time, it is a roll call vote to accept the student activity fee in the amount of $50 for the 2020-2021 uh, calendar year for the schools. Uh, Kathleen Palachko. Yes. Uh, Sean O'Shea. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. Kathy Key. Yes. Kathy ha Kathleen Holland. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. Chris Covino. Yes. Paul Baca. Yes. Karen Ayers. Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. It passes unanimous. The next vote that we have is the tiny tomahawks fee, which was in the amount of fifty dollars. And the screen um, with the um, figures is for your review. Thank you, Becky, for putting that up. So, is, moved, Joan. Yes. So moved. So moved by Dan Kalenda. Second. Second, Sean. Second by Sean O'Shea. Mm -hmm. Any discussion or comments by board members before we take the vote? Okay, seeing none, uh, this will be a roll call vote. So this is Tiny Tomahawks for a fee of $50 for the year 2020-2021. Kathleen Palachko. Yes. Sean O'Shea. Yes. Dan Kalenda. Yes. Kathy Key. Yes. Kathleen Holland. Yes. Paul Desmond. Yes. Chris Covino. Yes. Paul Bucca. Yes. Karen Ayers. Yes. And I vote in affirmative. It passes unanimous. Thank you very much, board members. And thank you to Becky for the wonderful presentation, for Mr. Sean Bevan, and for Mike Marcerino, and everybody else in the administration that helped to get these background information and make it very concise and uh, for the board members to see. So I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Greg, are we on to number five of our agenda now? So as the, the school committee is aware, um, you know, we've been uh, negotiating with the Algonquin Regional Teachers Association on reopening. Um, as part of that process, we entered into interest-based bargaining, which um, the association and the school committee agreed to. And just a little bit of background of, around interest-based bargaining. Um, we identify the issues together with working with the association. And then we come up with um, what are the common interests that we have. Um, so after two sessions, um, we've, we identified the issues, we came up with the common interests, and after two sessions, we came up with a tentative agreement. And as part of interest-based bargaining, um, the next step once a tentative agreement is reached is bring it back to the larger committee for a vote on the agreement in its entirety. So this evening, it's... Um, the committee's vote to um, approve the MOA that was negotiated um, in collaboration with ARDA. And I'll just highlight kind of the six bullet points that the MOA um, uh, connects to. So it's health and safety practices, protocols and equipment, um, learning models and schedules, educator health and wellness, changes in teaching and learning practices, accommodations and sick time and leaves of absence, and lastly, uh, professional development. And again, after two sessions, we came up with a tentative agreement. Um, and this evening, it is uh, the will of the committee to vote the, the agreement in its entirety. And Heather, I'm not sure if there's anything else you would like to add. I, th I think that was very clear and succinct. Thank you. So do we have a motion to ratify the memorandum of agreement 2020 to 2021 school year reopening between Northborough Southborough Regional School Committees and Algonquin Regional Teachers Association? So moved. So 
Moved by Paul Bucca, seconded by? Second, Chris Covino. Chris Covino. Before, uh, is there any discussion? Paul Bucca? So just a reminder to the, to the members of the committee who weren't part of the negotiating team and stuff, one of the, one of the uh, tenants of interest-based bargaining that, that those of us who were there have kind of signed up for is that um, we've, we've kind of made an agreement with everyone there that once we had reached consensus on, on this thing, it was kind of our job to convince the rest of you to, uh, to vote and approve this, this memorandum of understanding. So um, if you could help us make that all happen, that would be terrific, and we would then have done our job. And I'd like to thank the members of the um, Subcommittee on Collective Bargaining, which were Chris Covino, Sean O'Shea, Paul Bucca, um, uh, Kathy Key, and, um, and then also stepping in tomorrow will be Kathleen Polechko. So I'd like to thank them and for the two sessions that we had and for their intellect, their wisdom, and their cooperative spirit in moving this forward. So I really appreciate the members and definitely the administration, Lois Mason, who came in. Heather, you've been a wonderful resource, such a calm, smooth, eloquent during this, following in the same footsteps of Greg. So I, I'm very pleased by the leadership that we have going through in such a hard and difficult time, but trying to find um, reasonable and I think a very fair uh, MOA. So I really appreciate everything that you have done. And Becky also, and I know Stephanie, you've had a part in it too, you, uh, the whole entire team there at the administration, and Mary Ellen Duggan, the part that you have played also. So hats off uh, to all of you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Greg? I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, uh, Arda and they're willing to partner us with us in the IBB process. Um, you know, Nikki Rufo uh, and Christina Smith um, and their leadership um, in, in helping us make and move this forward um, in the best interests of students. Um, let me get my participants thing. Uh, are there any comments? or discussion before we go for the vote. Okay, seeing none, this will be a roll call vote. Motion, motion was made by Paul Bucca, seconded by Chris Covino to ratify the MOA with the Algonquin teachers. Uh, Kathleen Pluchko? Yes. Sean O'Shea? Dan Kalenda? Yes. Kathy Key? <clears throat> yes. Kathleen Holland? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Chris Covino? Yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Karen Ayers? Yes. And myself, and it passes unanimous. And I would also like to say that Chris Covino and Sean O'Shea will not be participating tomorrow because of their uh, teacher and principal um, duties that they have in their respective districts. So thank you for your dedication. And the next item we have is policy development and or just distribution and we have first readings. Pass it over to Greg. So in your packet are uh, two new policies. Unfortunately, they are both pandemic related. Um, the first policy is uh, face and covering policy, um, which basically speaks to um, face masks and, and what the processes and pro protocols are. And I'll have Mary Ellen speak briefly on that policy. And the sec second policy is the general uh, interim policy on COVID-related issues. We have a number of policies in our policy manual. Um, and basically, this puts a pause on many of those policies that we need to, um, again, pause as a result of the pandemic. Um, and once the pandemic it has passed, this interim uh, policy will be rescinded. So, Mary Ellen, I don't know if you want to speak to the um face covering policy sure you're gonna bring it up or do, yeah. just do it from memory let's see what your memory is like <laughs> all right so the face covering policy starts out with um defining 
what the uh, exceptions or exemptions are for wearing a face covering at school. Um, first, it defines that we are requiring face coverings for everybody pre-K through 12 in our district. Um, and then um, it goes to define what the exceptions are and they are very limited and they are CDC outlines of what is an exception. And it's um, pretty specific. It's if someone is incapacitated or unconscious, having trouble breathing or cannot remove the face mask by themselves. So those would be people who would be excused from our requirement of wearing a face mask. And we are saying that the face masks or face coverings need to be properly worn covering the mouth and the nose by all individuals in our school buildings, on our school grounds, and on school transportation. Um, there are other reasons why a person could have an exemption, and that would include medical, behavioral, or other challenging um, issues, which make it unsafe for that person to wear a face mask or face covering. And this would be an exemption that would be accepted with a written note from a licensed care provider um, with a request for the exemption. And then the principal, the school nurse, or the administration and the school nurse, um, along with the parents, would meet and discuss this exemption um, and either um, accept it or work with the family to see if there's something we could do to make it so that the child could wear a mask. Um, there, here it is that parents cannot write a waiver for their child to be excused from wearing a mask. That is not accepted and it's stated in this policy. Um, there are instances where face coverings or face masks will not be required to be worn when social distancing or physical distancing is enforced appropriately, which is greater than six feet. And that is during mask breaks, defined mask breaks. Um, while eating or drinking and during um, physical education while physical education is outside. So um, the final bullet here, there was a little bit of confusion where the while outside was a bullet by itself, but that is not a reason where face masks should be required. So that um, last fourth bullet needs to be deleted and it was moved up to what physical education while outside. Um, so the, this, that next paragraph just explains what I said already, what the exceptions would be and what we would do. Um, it says face shields or physical barriers may be provided as an alternative in some instances, and those would be discussed on individual basis. Um, this next sentence where the student states that the student's mask or face covering will be provided by the family. The district will supply masks for staff members. Um, this sentence in red um, may be a little bit confusing with the wording, but what it is saying is that we will set the standards for the face masks and the quality and type of masks that are required. And um, as of right now, the medical advisory team, which is included in our guidelines, not in our policy, because it's very specific and it could change with research that comes out. Our medical advisory team has determined that gaiters and bandanas are not an acceptable face covering to be worn at school. Um, so the wording on that sentence in red may need to be um, more specific to be clearer as to what that sentence means. And then if there is a violation of this policy, then it, we would work with the parents and the student to determine whether an exception or an exemption is appropriate for the student, whether additional education is needed, um, whether any accommodations need to be made for the student, and if um, it is determined that none of those things are needed and the student is still um, in violation of the policy, it would become a disciplinary issue. And I think that's kind of sums that up in a little nutshell. There are guidelines 
that go along with this for there's a face mask for student guideline and a face mask for staff guideline as well as educational things on masks for families educational resources for parents and students so so this is an important policy so it um is a first read this evening um and um we will want to vote it at the, the next regional uh, school committee meeting prior to students beginning um, in session, in person session. Are there any uh, questions? Joan, if I may? Yes, Dan. So if you wouldn't mind just scrolling up a little bit, just very minor, but it looks like, so is that at the bottom of that, is it supposed to end somewhere else with the strike through? It seems like it's maintain these school transportation without, I'm, I'm not sure what, where that's supposed to end. So I think this paragraph here um, says a lot of different things <laughs> and I'm not sure it's very clear, but the, okay. um, it, I think it should start out, the red sentence should really be first saying the district will um, provide the standards about masks. And that's basically what that red sentence is saying. So that'll be cleaned up uh, before we receive something next meeting for a final, for an actual vote. So this is, this Paul, this is one, I mean, Dan, this is one of the policies that we want combined across all three districts. So we're going to convene the policy subcommittees and kind of wordsmith some of these areas that okay. are unclear. And then uh, my only other question is, and maybe it's in the guidelines, that's part of an attachment, but, uh, you know, there, there are some pretty wild, um, well, I mean, it's, everything's in the eye of the beholder, um, different types of masks out there that students may choose uh, to bring. Maybe their parents don't know about it, um, but, you know, uh, are there guidelines as to what a, you know, what a student can wear, what kind of messaging they want to put on their mask, et cetera? We haven't really gone there yet, Dan, but Sean, um, I guess I, I really Sean, didn't even think about that. Sean could take that because it would be part of the handbook. Sean, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think that would simply, Dan, fall under the um, our policies for what's acceptable for any any type of clothing that students would wear. If it's disrupt disruptive to the school learning environment, it wouldn't it wouldn't be per, it would be prepared. okay. And I think that's that's right on. I just didn't see it in here and. Uh, maybe it'll be referenced or cross -re cross referenced. Maybe it doesn't even need to be. Um, but uh, thank you for that. I, I, that's that was the only other question. Thank you for bringing that up, Dan. Okay. Um, any other for comment? Further comments, Dan? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other comments or questions from the board members right now. So, so we'll go so on to the next one. So the next policy is the, it's an interim policy and COVID related issues. And basically it speaks to those policies that in normal operating conditions it would be, um, would be not an issue, um, but could pose an issue and basically um, give some flexibility to work with the school committee and um, suspend or modify um, based on the COVID-19 emergency. Those policies are like class size, um, attendance, and attendance is a great example where, you know, we're really encouraging students to, well, they need to stay home if, if they have one of the symptoms. Um, so we do not want students coming in sick which could impact a student's attendance. So again, looking, looking at um, providing some flexibility around that. Time on learning. So again, the Commissioner of Education um, has reduced the time on learning. So this just aligns to the Commissioner's change from 990 to 935. Uh, visitors in school buildings. So obviously, typically we're a very welcoming um, district, but in this particular case, we are limiting visitors um, and then lastly, just illness and contact tracing. Um, 
just provisions to the back to the school uh, plan. Um, we have protocols working in concert with the Board of Health around contact tracing um, and, and having protocols that are consistent with, with laws and regulations and maintain student privacy. So again, this is an interim policy that um, would be in place until the pandemic um, is no longer in place. And then we'd rescind this policy at that point in time. So this policy will go back to the subcommittee on, on policy development and then come back to us at our next meeting for a second read and acceptance, correct? That is correct. Okay. Any questions from any board members? Okay. And uh, so those that are serving on the policy, just be aware there'll probably be a meeting notification or a doodle poll. So watch your emails. Okay, the next item that we have, we're done with policies, is audience sharing. And at this time, I'd like to open it up first to the school committee to see if there is anything that anybody has that they would like to share, or even administrators on something that we have missed that you'd like to share. So I... Greg? So I just have um, just a couple of updates um, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, one of the things that um, on August 21st, um, teachers in critical support staff in remote learning districts, vulnerable students and children of teaching. So basically that um, it did place an emphasis on helping teachers find childcare and looking at different opportunities to do that. So as a district, we are working in partnership with um, some of our extended day programs to free up spots. Keith LaVoy is taking that leadership role. Also um, on the, the commissioner did um, create some guidelines that if a school is in, re is in remote session, that teachers will report to um, their buildings and teach from their, their facilities and their buildings. Um, and lastly, um, on August 20th, they released some information around um, having some uh, mobile testing um, and free, uh, free testing. Um, so, and a stop the spread initiative. So if there was a situation where Algonquin had a number of cases of COVID, um, a mobile testing uh, stop the spread initiative would come to the campus and actually do some testing for us. So those are some of the, the initiatives at the state level that are impacting our work at the local level. Yeah, those were some really good initiatives. I was really imp impressed by the mobile testing that they would come out to us uh, and very, very, very helpful. Um, uh, the next uh, that I see a board member is Karen Ayers. Karen? Thanks, Joan. Um, so I had, um, I'm bringing this all to you now as a school committee, and it's not COVID related, so maybe you'll be a little bit happy about that. But um, I had received a letter um, that I wanted to share with you all from, um, from some concerned parents um, about a development that's proposed on Bartlett Street in Northboro. Um, and so as Algonquin is listed as a butter on this particular development, um, they have raised some concerns. And so I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, so I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it's, it's addressed to me and shared with you. And there's about 35, 34 families listed on the email. And it says, Dear Karen, as secretary of the Joint School Committee for the Northboro and Southboro Regional School Committee, I wanted to inform you of a proposed development plan for a distribution facility at on Bartlett Street that abuts Algonquin Regional High School. Zero Bartlett Street's proposed size is approximately 160,000 square feet with 33 bays for trucks and 150 employees. Um, and then it gives um, a link for where I can you can find the proposed plan. Um, it says as neighbors of Algonquin and town residents, we wanted to make you aware of our concerns because the site would have a significantly negative impact on the high school and its community. 
Um, and then they lift, list various concerns. The first is traffic concerns. It says, as you may know, there are already several large distribution facilities along Bartlett Street near the high school, many of which are currently vacant. We are very concerned that should this facility nearest the high school be approved and the other facilities find tenants, the traffic situation on Bartlett Street and around the entrance to Algonquin would be untenable. We are especially concerned because a large segment of the drivers in and out of the high school are new and experienced, many still learning. While the applicant has submitted a proposal where the trucks could only make a left turn out of the site away from the high school, this plan is unenforceable without daily police presence and would not be applicable to the 150 employees at the site. Also, many students live in Southboro and come and go to Algonquin via Cedar Hill Road. So a left turn only for trucks would have no helpful impact on them. The applicant has submitted a traffic survey completed by their appointed agent, but as neighbors of the high school and witnesses to the pre-COVID traffic each day, each and every day. We are questioning their results, which were done one day in October uh, 2019. The planning board is considering a peer review by a surveyor whom they designate. Um, their current application traffic survey is below. Um, they also list a fair amount of groundwater concerns um, because of Northboro's alternate water supply for the town should we need it. Um, would be this proposed development is going to be over that. Um, I'm just not going to read that whole thing. I think the traffic thing is definitely something that uh, affects uh, Algonquin. And then the environmental wildlife impact, it says the distribution facility would significantly reduce the Sturt Brook Trail, which is used by students at the high school for cross country, cross country skiing and other phys ed and extracurricular activities. It would also immeasurably impact the home to such wildlife, potentially causing harm to students who use high school fields from early morning to dusk. It says, we realize this type of site plan is not normally the school, school committee's domain, but as it has direct negative implications for the high school and its community, we wanted to inform you of the proposal as well as our concerns. And then, excuse me, they said they hope they will share this email with the entire school committee um, and then they said, obviously, there's 34 families here, most already at the high school or soon will be. And this signed uh, Rachel and Rich Armstrong from 10 Hemlock Drive and Kristen and John Wickstead from 2 Stirrup Brook Lane. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring that up to you tonight because um, I myself am very concerned about this um, proposal. Um, and I am wanted to get your thoughts on developing a letter to send to the on behalf of the school committee the regional school committee to send to the Northboro planning board um, expressing our concern for the development so I'll open up to thoughts to the chair so um you know knowing that we're the butters to it um I don't know, I, w I would always think that we would get some kind of communication through them. Uh, Greg, what, what is your, I think a letter would be helpful to the planning board or your discussion with John Kader and uh, make him, I mean, I, I know he's aware of this, but I mean, do we, what is, what is our step to go forward? Joan, a, a point of order, please, if I could. Sure. Um, that sounds like we're starting to deliberate on something that's not on the agenda. Okay. We, we do that with audience sharing. Okay. Thanks, Paul. All right. So, Greg. So, my, so my recommendation is if um, Karen, if you can share that letter with me, and I'll distribute that to the committee members, and we can have it as an agenda topic on the next meeting, and that way we can also do some homework in the meantime. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the clarification. I appreciate it. Um, are there any other uh, board members that have anything with during audience sharing? Uh, Greg, I see that we have 32 participants, probably about maybe 12 other than us. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to share? I would just like to say, Kathleen though. Kathleen, were you? Pardon me? 
Yeah, I yeah. think Kathleen Holland was trying to raise her hand. Oh, okay. Kathleen, first. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would uh, like to get a presentation, if we could, on the agenda next time um, that would parallel the, the athletics, which was really helpful to understand mild, moderate risk of activities and modifications of activities that are being required of the arts program, both fine arts and music, please. Okay. Thank you. Through the chair, please. Uh, yes. Just to let you know, Kathleen, all of those guys are in the guidelines, all of the modifications to all of those programs, theater, musical theater, um, and band and chorus. And I'd like to get the, the practicalities of implementing them and maintaining the, um, uh, the curriculum standards. Thank you. Okay, I'll put that down for an agenda item. Okay. And I'll be in touch with you, Kathleen, to get more specifics on that, okay? Sure. Okay. Um, and the audience sharing, and I broke the rule, um, is there's no deliberations. It's just a matter of us to take the information and then to uh, have it uh, filter through the superintendent to see if it would be an agenda item in the future or um, how we could solve the uh, community concern or remark. And be doing, seeing that it's a time at 5 after 10, I looked at our uh, agenda and audience sharing. We don't have a time limit, but I would like to put a time limit on it, uh, if possible, to five minutes. And at five minutes, tell them that whoever is sharing that that's limited and we could give them an extra minute. Uh, how do the board members feel about that? Chris, thumbs up? Okay. So, I mean, and that's something maybe we can look at a policy because we don't have anything on audience sharing, but I mean, I think five minutes and then an extension of one. Okay, so Greg, do you want, is there anyone who would like to join us in the meeting tonight? If there's anyone in the audience, any attendees would like to share if you raise your hand and I will promote you as a panelist to um, share your thoughts. So with the appropriate wait time, it does not look like we have any of our attendees who um, will be sharing at this time tonight. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so we have one, is there any other, it, usually it's not here, but we usually we ask the board members any agenda items for the next meeting. Is there anything else beside what Kathleen Hallam had brought up about the fine arts? Is there anything else? And also the letter from Karen um, about the proposed distribution center that's in a butter to Algonquin Regional High School. Any other agenda items, Kathleen? I don't know that it would be for next um, time. I think it would be too soon. But pursuant to Mr. Kalenda's topic that people hadn't learned anything um, in the spring semester, I, I would like to uh, have an understanding of the initial assessments and how things are looking for the start of the year. How much have children lost? Um, how ubiquitous has that been? I'm not sure if that can be done, but I'd like to move forward with data um, on that, please. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, any other items for on the agenda? For uh, probably September. Okay. Seeing none, at this time I would, uh, that is the end of the items that we have on our agenda for tonight. So um, at this time I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting of August the 26th. So moved. So moved by Paul Bucket. Is there a I, second? I second that. Kathleen. Alan seconded. Any, I know there's not going to be any discussion. So uh, roll call vote. Karen, uh, Kathleen Pelechko? Yes. Shauna Shea? Yes. Dan Kalenda? Yes. Kathy Key? Yes. Kathleen Holland? Yes. Paul Desmond? Yes. Chris Covino? 
Yes. Paul Bucca? Yes. Karen Ayers? Yes. And myself is affirmative and it's unanimous. And thank you everybody, administration, school committee members, thank you so much for all the time and effort and I'll see some of you guys tomorrow morning. All right. Good night everybody. Night.